Shalom. I'd like to speak about praying and praying for Aliyah specifically. I would like to encourage us as believers to pray and to pray specifically for the Aliyah. In case you're not familiar with this word, um, let me explain. The Hebrew word Aliyah means going up or ascending. It is used especially for Jewish people who return from exile to Israel. They go up or ascend to Israel and Jerusalem. Jesus spoke a parable in chap Luke chapter 18. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So we are encouraged to pray always and not lose heart or give up. At one time, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. He taught them and us a model prayer, which we now call the Lord's Prayer. I would like to come back to the Lord's Prayer in a little while. But first, let me draw your attention to a couple of words in the great commandment or the great commission that Jesus gave his disciples after his resurrection. He said to them in Matthew chapter 28, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Them here refers to all the nations spoken of in the previous verse. This means that the teaching of the Word of God, including the teaching of Jesus on prayer, will be transmitted from nation to nation, from people to people, from language to language until all the nations have been reached. It also means that the teaching of the Word of God, including the teaching on prayer by Jesus, will be transmitted from generation to generation until the last generation. Now let us read the first part of the Lord's Prayer the first four sentences from Luke chapter 11. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the first prayer sentence, we pray to our Father that speaks so much of a close, intimate, family type of relationship. We are his children, his sons and his daughters. We pray to our Father in heaven, but truly our Father God is much greater than heaven. When inaugurating the temple in Jerusalem some 3,000 years ago, King Solomon prayed like this in 1 Kings chapter 8. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. King Solomon understood that God is the creator, which means that the heavens and the earth and everything in them have been created by our Father. He is so great that he speaks in the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Our Father is so great and powerful, so wise and glorious, so victorious and majestic. He is exalted as head 
over all. Therefore, in the second prayer sentence, Jesus taught us to pray, Hallowed be your name. Our desire is to keep his name holy and sanctified. We fear him and revere him. We stand in awe of him. We bow down before him and worship him. The prophet Habakkuk expressed himself in this way. When I heard, my body trembled. In the third prayer sentence, we pray, May your kingdom come. We pray for our Father's authority and rule to be established, his kingdom purposes to be realised. Listen to the words of the great prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In the fourth prayer sentence we say, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father has revealed his will through his word, the Bible. Anyone reading through the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi will easily find scores of scriptures about the return of the Jewish people from the ends of the earth back to the land of Israel, which has been given them for all time. Let us read some of them. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, the scriptures say, If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of uh, under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then your Lord, the Lord your God, will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. In Psalm 147 we read, The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Listen to the words in Isaiah chapter 43. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, Give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Finally, let us hear the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a, the shepherd does his flock. The common message of these scriptures is that our Father, the God of Israel, says that he will gather the Jewish people from all nations and bring them back to Israel, the land their ancestors possessed. I can assure you 
that many, many such scriptures are to be found in the Bible. Let us now summarize the scriptures we have looked at. Firstly, Jesus teaches us that we ought to pray always, not losing heart. Secondly, he also teaches us that we should teach all the nations the word of God. Thirdly, he teaches us to pray for our Father's will to be done. Fourthly, the will of God is revealed in the Bible. Fifthly, it is the will of our Father to bring the Jewish people back to Israel. And finally, a subject of great importance in the Bible is the return of the Jewish people and the restoration of Israel. Adding all these things together, we conclude that our Father God desires us as his children to pray for the return of the Jewish people. And this desire of our Father is extraordinarily strong because the Jewish people is the apple of his eye, as he says in Zechariah chapter 2. And in Zechariah chapter 1, our Father speaks, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. And a little later in the same chapter, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. So, there is no doubt, our Father wants us to pray for the return of the Jewish people. He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of Israel. He has chosen the Jewish people. He loves them. He is zealous for them. And he has promised to restore them. We are our Father's children. And we must see the Jewish people and Israel through his eyes. But it is not enough just to be a passive observer. Our Father is looking for a response. He's looking for believers who engage and commit themselves to obey and participate. Here, we are talking about prayer for the Aliyah and our Father is looking for a response from us in prayer and intercession for the return of the Jewish people. In Ezekiel chapter 22, the Lord says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. And in Isaiah chapter 59, the scripture says, He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. We see that our Father does not always find what he is looking for. But if we look in the Bible, we can find wonderful examples of saints who stood in the gap before the Lord for the Jewish people and Israel, who prayed and interceded. I think of Abraham, who still stood before the Lord and came near and continued until the Lord had finished speaking with him. See Genesis chapter 18. I think of Moses, his chosen one, who stood before him in the breach. This we found in Psalm 140, 106. I think of Samuel, who said to the people of Israel, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. 
We find this in 1 Samuel 12. And I think of Daniel, who confessed his and his people's sins and prayed, O Lord, hear! O Lord, forgive! O Lord, listen and act! Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. See Daniel chapter 9. Our Father is asking us, in a similar way, to come before him in prayer and intercession for the return of the Jewish people. This has been true whenever the Jewish people have been exiled from their land. But when is the time for the great end time Aliyah? When is the time of the Lord's fulfilling his promises? How can we know? My answer is that we need the Holy Spirit to make us alive to the Bible, to bring scriptures to our attention, to give us a burden for what he is going to do. And then we need to mix the word with faith, as it says in Hebrews chapter 9. After the Jewish wars between 70 AD and 135 AD, most of the Jews living in Israel were killed or exiled. There was, however, and has always been, a remnant of Jews in the land right through to the present time. As far as I'm aware, there were only small-scale attempts by the Jewish people to settle in the Holy Land after that time and until uh, before the 1880s. During the centuries relatively few Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews arrived in the Holy Land. Most of these colonies did not thrive. But in 1882, the first wave of the modern Aliyah started with a group of Yemenite Jews arriving in Jerusalem, as well as European Jews coming from areas in the Russian Empire. But it is interesting to note that a group of Christians arrived in Jerusalem in 1881 because they wanted to see the Jews come back. They believed the prophetic scriptures and felt that the Lord had called them back to Jerusalem to pray for the return of the Jewish people. The number of Jews returning continued to grow decade by decade in Aliyah wave after Aliyah wave. It was as if a tiny crack appeared in the dam wall and slowly, little by little, grew wider, allowing more and more water to pour through. And all the time, our Father called believers to pray for the return of the Jews. If we broadly consider the modern-day Aliyah from the start until the present time, we might say that there have been three major Aliyah waves so far. The first wave lasted from the beginning of, in 1882 until just before the proclamation of the State of Israel. During that time, from 1882 to 1948, 66 years, approximately 550,000 Jewish people made Aliyah. The second wave began with the establishment of Israel in 1948 and continued to 1989. During these 41 years, approximately 1.9 million Jewish people made Aliyah. The Lord called Rhys Howells and the staff of the Bible College of Wales to pray for the restoration of Israel and the return of the Jewish people 
towards the end of World War II up to 1948. The third wave began with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989 until the present day. During these 30 years, approximately 1,700,000 Jewish people made Aliyah. In 1974, Steve Lytle received the vision that the Lord would bring the Jews of the Soviet Union back to Israel. And during the 1980s, the Lord called several intercessors to pray for the Jewish people to be free. Among them, Steve himself, Shel Sherberg, Johannes Farsius, and Eliyahu Benheim. To sum up, each major Aliyah wave has been preceded and prepared by prayer. In the first Aliyah wave, 550,000 people returned in 66 years. In the second Aliyah wave, 1.9 million people returned in 41 years. In the third wave, 1.7 million people returned in 30 years. Now, we believe we are on the threshold of the fourth major wave of Aliyah. Our Father, the Lord of hosts, has done an amazing and marvellous work in our time. He will continue to do so, even greater things, and he's calling us to participate in prayer and practical assistance. Aliyah, the return of the Jewish people back to their land of Israel, is truly one of the most important signs of the time. We read in Psalm 102, You will arise and have mercy on Zion, for the time to favour her, yes, the set time has come. May the Father's blessing be upon you.